but when it comes to test cricket, come on. What we've witnessed over the past couple of years has been a transformation in the results of the England side, but, but more strikingly in, in how the game has been played after one win in 17 tests, including a heavy defeat in the Ashes and a very disappointing loss in the West Indies, there was no doubt that the team needed to go in a new direction. And of course, they turned to the former New Zealand player, Brendan McCullum, and Baz Ball was born. Well, the story of that amazing turnaround is told in a new book called Baz Ball, The Inside Story of a Test Cricket Revolution, which is published today. It's written by Nick Holt from The Telegraph, who I think is on his way out here, uh, and Lawrence Booth, the editor of Wisdom. And, of course, uh, Lawrence is here. And Baz Ball, then, you, you, you and Nick have got this book out pretty quickly, haven't you? Is, 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 yeah. is, is it today it comes out? It is published today right. uh, by well, Bloomsbury. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was kind of... It was a hair-raising experience at times because we were writing it during the Ashes and of course when England went 2-0 down at Lords yes. I thought this is not going to play well with the, the theme of this book which So is you're always the... going to write about Basball before the Ashes? We were, yes okay, right. and the Ashes was going to be the, in, in theory the sort of icing on the cake we, not that we necessarily expected England to win but we thought yep. it would be a good series and as it turned out it was a good series but at 2-0 down with the knives out after that performance at Lords, with everyone getting yep. out to the short ball. Remember, you had a chat with Ben Duckett, didn't you? Which sort of, yes. well, I think we mentioned in the book actually. <laughs> um, uh, so th we thought, well, this could be interesting. And then England deprived by rain in Manchester, yep. but then fighting back at the Oval. But even on the last day at the Oval, look, it rained in Australia. What three down, four down, going into that rain break? It was 4 p.m. when play resumed, and for the sake of the book's narrative, an England win was, was nice and a two-all two sort of comeback wrapped it up nicely. But it was, you know, it was interesting at times. It was. It was a fascinating series. I, I don't think it beat 2005. I think some people actually perhaps over-exited a bit, but it was, there was a lot to, to, to love about it. In a sentence, and, and I think we... Well, I, I don't know I did. I'm, I'm perhaps putting everyone in this, but I, we were all searching for sort of a definition of Basball. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to give it the name that, that Baz himself doesn't like. Yeah. Um, if, if, have you got a definition in a sentence of what, what it actually is? Well, it, it, uh, it's a mindset that allows you to remove the fear of failure, essentially. Yes. That is what McCullum has sort of inculcated in the team. It's quite a trick to pull off because, of course, we all know in this sort of small cricket world that cricket matters to us and it matters hugely to the players. But McCullum and Stokes managed to convince the England Test team that it didn't matter as much as everyone said it did. And that gave them a certain freedom. And it is essentially the sports, any sports holy grail, is mm. to be able to go out there, convince yourself that it doesn't matter, and therefore play with the freedom, which has a double effect. You, you, you play better yourself, probably, and then you, put, you, you scare the bejesus out of the opposition because yes. they're thinking, what's coming at us next? And though, of course, England lost that first Test at Edgbaston, I mean, they should have won, let's face it. Yes. Zach Crawley hits the first ball through the covers and that lifts everyone immediately and of course the first ball of the Ashes had so often been a, 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 a sort of an anti-England story mm. down the year so Crawley sort of reclaimed some of that narrative and he as much as anyone embodied the, the sort of basball change in, in, in attitude really lots of people thought he shouldn't have been picked for that team but yes. by the end he was England's player of the series and his 189 at Old Trafford was probably the innings of the series yeah and, and in a way, to cement that mentality of f without fear of failure, he had to play, didn't he? I mean, if they, if they had actually said, don't worry, if it goes wrong, you're not going to be dropped. We've got total faith in you, but sorry, Zach, you dropped. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, they, they, so yeah, actually, yeah. he was quite, quite a sort of litmus test, in a way, of, of, of it. He was, and he, and he admitted he was lucky. I mean, he thought after that tour of New Zealand where they lost the second test by one run, hmm. that he was out, he was done. And you look at guys in the past, like, say, Graham Hick or Mark Rampagash, how might they have fared in yeah. a setup that backed them Indeed. consistently? Um, so, you know, the Basball, they've only dropped a couple of players, really. Alex Lees, at the end of the 22 summer, did yep. go to Pakistan. By the way, he's set last summer alight with Durham, really, you know, averaging 70-odd with a very high strike rate. And Ben Folkes, who had to yep. make way, and that was, of course, a, a big issue because Bairstow was the standard bearer of Basball when it started in 2022, broke his leg when he was fit again. England felt they had to pick him. So that, that angered a lot of traditionalist purists who want to see the best wicket keeper behind the stumps. So there are all kinds of debates going into the Ashes last summer that added to yeah. the story. So your definition is that it's a mindset rather than the flailing bats that you see and, and, that, and that, so that, that's a sort of a, that's kind of part of it down the line, but it's, it's the mindset. I, th I think so. Um, and I think the flailing bats business got overdone a bit by 
well, Australians wanted to talk down Basball particularly. Yes. I mean, on the back of our book, we got Nathan Lyons saying, what Basball? I didn't see any Basball. And David <laughs> right. Warner said, I, they didn't play any Basball. Because I think in their minds, Basball was slogging. I mean, Mitchell Stark, the Australian fast bowler, said before they arrived in England, well, what are they going to do at, at five for 50, to, to put it in the Australian order? Yes. Are they going to keep swinging? Well, that was never really what Basball was about, despite that sort of mad half hour at Lord's. Uh, where it looked like they'd fallen into all the short ball plans that Australia had set for them. But I yep. think they recalibrated after that and played slightly smarter cricket. Um, you know, came out at Headingley and got themselves out of a tricky position. What were they, 140 for seven at lunch on the yep. second day in reply to 263? And at that point, you're thinking, 3 0 looks the most likely score at this point. And, yeah. And we could be in trouble. You see, I, but you could quote, I, I love the figures that you have here, the comparison uh, with Zach Crawley and Usman Khawaja, actually. Yeah. Because that, that really does, that, that defines it, doesn't it? In that uh, the runs that they scored, Khawaja basically scored in the series 16 runs more than Crawley did, but it took him personally 120 overs yeah. to score those 16 runs it's astonishing and, and that that doesn't that absolutely sort of encapsulate what this whole thing is about that yeah. those are 120 overs how much use would they be now on the other hand and i mentioned them to finney actually uh, before it's that's, that's incredible he said yeah what about our bowlers you know they never got a chance they never sat down for five minutes and of course that is the counter argument isn't it yeah. that actually yes england scored those runs so fast that England's bowlers were out they go again, puffing away, and, and didn't have the rest that they needed. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a fine line. Absolutely. But that, that comparison's fascinating, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, the Ashes was a, was a clash of philosophies as much as anything. Yeah. Australia came to England determined to show that you could win in the old way, and Kawaja was the absolute personification of that. Um, he, he actually went, he went more into a shell as the series progressed a bit, almost like he was making a point. He was the anti baz baller, and he wanted to show that 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 way could work. In fact, you know, without him, Australia wouldn't have won at Edgbaston, 140 yes. and, and 60 odd. But they might also have lost that game because he batted so slowly on the last day. And don't forget that when Australia's eighth wicket fell, they still needed 54 or 55. Absolutely. And generally, you don't win matches from that position. So England might argue that everything they'd done up to that point in that game, including the controversial first evening declaration, was justified. They'd built a winning position. It's just they couldn't finish it off. Um, but no, the, the contrast between Kowaja and Crawley was, was fascinating. Yeah, and they were both excellent in their own ways. What did you come across with that declaration? Who, who, who have you talked to and, and, and what sort of different, different input have you had about people's views about whether that was right or not? The, the players mainly defended it as you'd expect because yeah. their view was that uh, it was very much in keeping with Stokes' attitude which was that against a good team like Australia you have to seize little windows of opportunity to get on top of them. And his idea was that that evening if we take one, yep. if we reopen the Stuart Ward, Broad v David yep. Warner debate... Nip a couple out nip a couple out we are in yeah. total control of that game it's like an old three day championship man. yeah it was a bit exactly yeah. right yeah and of course and some people felt it was hubristic by England no, Joe Root was 118 not out hitting the ball very nicely Robinson was at the other end playing quite well couldn't they have batted on made 450 the next day from which point they probably wouldn't have lost the game well, I spoke to Mike Brearley and he was you know he was in two minds about he, he said I wouldn't have declared that night no. and yet uh, Stokes was absolutely adamant he was going to stick to this philosophy and fair play to him 2-0 down I mean, Brendan McCullum came out after Lords. We were standing on the outfield chatting to him, and he said, 3 2's got a nice ring to it. I mean, this is the kind of talk you would not have got from previous regimes. And yet, mm. with McCullum saying it, you could sort of half believe it. And he yeah. wasn't far off um, being, being correct on that. And, and had England sort of taken a backward step at that point, they might have lost four or five now. Yes. Um, I think it's only because they could, decided to keep going for it that they. Uh, they kept the pressure on Australia with the, the results we saw. They, they do say some strange things. <laughs> they think, I mean, whether they think we actually believe it or not. I mean, I interviewed Stokes at the start of the series, as always. And I said, is this approach going to win you the ashes, Ben? And he thought about it. He looked at me and said, uh, well, yeah, obviously you're hoping so. But if it doesn't... <laughs> and I thought at the time, what an extraordinary thing to say. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, shrugging his shoulders. And what do you think they mean that? No, he obviously wanted to win the Ashes, but it, it was all part of a device to take the pressure in his mind off the players so that you concentrate on the... I mean, it's not cliches, isn't it? You concentrate on the process, not the outcome. And by continuing to do that, you will end up with more wins than defeats, and you can look at them and say, well, 13 wins out of 18 since they'd won one out of 17. So yep. it's hard to argue with the, with the results. 
It's 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 worth just going back to. I don't know if you were there. You probably were. I'm seeing that. But were you there in Grenada? No, I wasn't there for that tour. Uh, but Nick, Nick would have was been there. there yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was there, and it was it was just terrible. It was just horrible, wasn't it? I mean, it was just a car crash, um, Red Bull reset, and all that stuff that we had had. Um, and to pick it up from that, it's pretty remarkable, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, it was two remarkable. new people coming in. I mean, Ben had to be captain. There was nobody else really. Uh, uh, and, and, and McCullum just came from total left field. What, what a, an appointment by Rob Key. Is that, yeah. that turned out to be from that starting point and, and to sort of just kick out Red Bull Reset and, and, and to, to turn that on its head and to start again. Yeah, uh, astonishing really. And actually it, it did English cricket a favour to lose that final test in Grenada. Yes. Kyle Mayer's his medium pace, knocking them over. Yes. Root finally accepting the go. truth that we, we kind of saw in Australia, didn't yeah. we? That he, he had to go. Uh, and that allowed Stokes to, with a, with a clear conscience, to take the job because he was asked in Australia about would he like that we were all sort of trying to read the runes and expecting that Root might be out on his ear after the Ashes. Yep. Stokes like, no, no, I'll ne I'd never do that. Even in the West Indies, we mention it in the book. He was going around in the bar in Grenada that night having a go at journos for you. You having a pop at my mate Joe? You yeah, know, yeah. he was still very loyal to him, and that actually their relationship is central to the whole story in a way because. With a, with a sort of less manageable character than Root going back into the ranks. That might have made it life tricky yep. for Stokes, but Root bought into it completely. And he said he did a good interview with us in the book saying that, um, you know, some people say you never regret anything in your career. That, that's rubbish. I regret lots of things. I wish, I wish we'd been more attacking. So when he took over the captaincy, 2017, first test against South Africa at Lords, he made 190. England scored at something like four and a half and over. And in the rest of his reign, I think they only scored faster in a test innings once. Okay. So he believed right. that they, they'd sort of stumble across something then, but they weren't able to maintain it. Perhaps he was, he was a bit critical of some of the coaching in the meantime. He, he certainly had regrets and, you know, he looks back at it and says, why couldn't we have played that way? It, it, it is a concern, but he bought into it completely. And of course, he scored the 100 against New Zealand at Lords that got the whole thing going, yes. chasing 270-odd. Yeah. Though, of course, it wasn't until Bairstow went berserk on the last afternoon at Trent Bridge that we thought, well, Nick, Nick had the idea, really, that uh, there's something going on with this team. Let, let's keep an eye on how this yeah. plays out. Who's the strongest character of the two, Stokes or McCullum? Who's in charge down there? Uh, well, I think Stokes is slightly strong. I mean, McCullum, he kept coming out with this comment that Stokes has got me covered. <laughs> you know, so you come up with these scenarios. So the, the run chase in Karachi, for example, it was yep. it went into the fourth morning, but on the third night, Stokes sent out Rayhan Ahmed as as the first night hawk. That's no, right. That was Stuart Broad's job, but he never got to do it. Yeah. He sent out Rayhan Ahmed at three, and then Stokes himself came out came out at four. You talked to the guys who were in the dressing room, said Stokes was almost he was on one. He was going on to finish it tonight. So there's no way they over. could have won that game. Absolutely not. No. But McCullum afterwards came out and said, well. That's where he, he takes it to another level from me. I'm positive. I thought I was positive until I met, met this guy. Yes. So I think Stokes is above McCullum even, but they, they're both singing essentially from the same hymn, hymn sheet. Without their, their agreement, their concurrence, that the whole thing wouldn't have happened. You know, you only needed a bit of doubt to creep in and it could fall apart. I mean, look, Ingl in England are coming to India in the new year for five tests yeah, of course very interesting a lot of people here at the moment are saying well that will be the acid test for, for yeah. Basball. Do they both need each other? I mean, could um, could Stokes be the captain that he is? And, and he's been a fabulous captain, actually, I think. A uh, um, lot of ingenuity. He's obviously led very strongly. But in Pakistan, he had to really work to, to, to get those, those results. And he, yeah. I thought his captain was brilliant. Could he have done that without McCullum? And, and, and would there be Baz Ball without Stokes? Probably not, no. And I think especially without Stokes, because he, the, the players, they respect him. They probably fear him a little. Yes, you know, and one of the questions he's got a look actually. In fact, he does have a look. Henry took, took a picture of him giving me that look uh, last summer, and it's, it's it sends a bit of a chill through. It does, and you yeah. can see how one of the questions we kept asking the players was, "Do you ever say no to Ben? Has anyone ever sort of stood up to him?" Mm. The one guy who said actually I had a bit of a ruck with him was Ollie Robinson against South, Af South Africa at the oh, Oval. Okay. He'd bowled a four over spell. He uh, he felt like he was about to take a wicket. There was a drinks break, and Stoke said. Right, we're going to come go on with um, Jimmy, at the other, whoever it was, Jimmy at the other end next yep. over, and, Ro and Robinson had to go at him, and Stokes was slightly taken aback, and then they got back into the dressing room afterwards, and Robinson, as Robinson describes, it's a bit of tension. You know, everyone was looking at us, thinking, you know, what's Stokes he going to say? Robbo had to go, and, and Ben said, "I'm glad you said what you did. People have got to stand up, uh, have oh, your okay. own opinions. I welcome that." So he's not he's he's not really as intimidating as perhaps they think he is, but I think they they fully respect him. They're prepared to do what he does. In the early days of Basball, he overdid it. 
he was getting yes. out caught at caught at mid Absolutely. on for six, charging down the pitch. And, yeah. England's second best player after Root. I think he's wasting yeah. his runs now. I think he he recalibrated himself so that by the Ashes he was striking at sixty eight per hundred, which was probably the lowest of the top six. Yeah. So he decided to show a bit more responsibility. Can it survive? Can Basball survive <laughs> uh, without McCullum and Stokes? I, I think it can. Su- well. They'll probably both go at roughly the same time. I mean, Stokes' knee means that yeah. if we get another two years out of him, we'll be doing well. McCullum's contract ends in a couple of years. Um, so they'll, they'll, do, they'll give it their best shot. But if Ollie Pope is, say, the captain, um, you, you can't possibly recreate the X factor no. that Stokes has. That's no you know, criticism of Pope, who'll be, you know, probably be a good England captain. But we may be looking at a kind of moment in time where everything has come together beautifully, a perfect storm that will be tough to recreate and therefore... It was a story we felt we'd better tell before it's yeah. over. Well, I, I appreciate my early copy, Lawrence, and thank you for coming <laughs> to talk to us, and very good luck to you and Nick with it. It's, it's, it's a really interesting read, and yes, uh, you did go through the index, and Duckett's interview is in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Agus. Thank you for that, and good luck, uh, Lawrence, with that.